So on to our next discussion on the governance of migration. Our speaker is Catherine Costello, Professor of Global Refugee and Migration Law at University College Dublin. She'll be joined by students from the same three institutions, Karin Borsch from Gothenburg University, Alonso Martinez from Chalmers, and Sylvia Papich from the International Youth Think Tank. Please welcome them. Uh, as a legal scholar, it feels quite daunting to come at the end of a day or towards the end of a day like this, having heard from Nobel Prize winning scientists, heard from musicians, uh, and really had this very broad introduction to the question about migration. I'm going to speak about how migration is governed, um, and I'm going to make an argument that how we govern migration is part of the problem. Um, and so that we need to address the laws and the institutions that currently shape who gets to move, mobility, who gets to work, migrate, uh, and who gets international protection, refugees and others. In doing this, I'm trying to, in 10 minutes, showcase a whole body of scholarship that's really introduced my thinking to the topic. Um, and answer, I think, five very big questions, or at least to open up these topics for discussion. So the first question is, who is governed when we talk about migration being governance? Today, we've uh, at times talked about this question as if there is a them and an us, the migrants and the refugees, and those of us who are not migrants and refugees. Of course, most of us have some migration or refugee history in the background. Sometimes it's our direct personal history. But I wanted us to pause for a second and think about the, the prior question. Who is subject to migration controls? And that is inherently a question about what nationality you have. And if you reflect for a moment on how you got that nationality, it is for all of us, for the most of us, uh, an accident of birth, of place or parentage. This ultimate arbitrary point. And a, in a wonderful book called The Birthright Lottery, Eilat Shahar, a political theorist and legal theorist I greatly admire, has problematized that the impact of our system of distributing nationality on global inequality. When we look across the passports that we have, each of them has a very different value from the point of view of mobility. If you have a good passport like mine, an EU passport, then you can travel not only all around the EU relatively freely, but you'll get visa-free travel to many other countries in the world. Mobility comes with an already uh, privileged passport. But for others, those mobility opportunities does not exist. We now have a passport index where we can see certain passports getting stronger or weaker. The Afghan passport has been way down at the bottom for as long as I can remember. But the patterns shift, and I think understanding those shifting patterns is really important. And a scholar who's done some really important work on that um, is Stefan Mao, uh, who in a book in German, it's called Die Sortiermaschine, has traced some of these differences. And on this very simple graph, you can see that there are winners and losers over time. Some people, some nationalities, have been losing mobility opportunities, while others have gained them. And for some of you in the audience, this may be a really palpable experience. You know, when I speak to Moroccan students, for example, somebody once said to me, just very poignantly, you know, my father was able to go interrailing across Europe, something which for him, with his bad passport, seemed uh, just a very unlikely, pros uh, uh, unlikely prospect. So we know the world of uh, migration and mobility are governed very unequally. Um, and I think one important question to ask is, are, is this inequality unfair? Is it unjust? And is it the sort of discrimination we should be condemning as being basically racial discrimination? Now, when lawyers talk about race discrimination, they don't just mean the intentional use of race as a category, as an overt category that is prohibited, but we also are concerned about indirect discrimination, where categories mask, apparently neutral categories, mask treating people differently on grounds of race. And there's one scholar, more than any other, I think, who's opened up that question for discussion. 
So if you were my students, you would be reading a lot of the work of Tendaya Chume, who's made some great contributions to this particular question, looking at inequalities between refugees and also uh, in migration governance more generally. So we have a system where the amount of mobility and migration opportunities that people have uh, varies greatly according to their nationality and also indirectly according to their race. This seems like you know, something that we should all be concerned about from the point of view of global justice and equality. The second question that I'm going to ask is not just who is governed, but where does migration governance take place? Because for the most part, we think about a border as a site of migration governance. But of course, what we know is that migration governance has been both exported and imported. And both trends mean that we have a shifting border. Uh, so much so that I think it's important to reflect on the fact that migration controls are almost everywhere. Uh, in a work of political philosophy, Chandra and Kukitas has actually critiqued uh, the justice of migration controls for their impact on liberties within states, within liberal democratic states. He once gave a lecture in Oxford at my invitation, and I didn't set it up, but at the end of the lecture, an administrator came and asked him to show his passport, because you have to show your passport all the time in the UK to show that you have a right to work. Uh, we always checked the immigration status of our students and so on. So this drawing in of borders is a feature of contemporary migration controls. And we also know that migration controls are externalized. They're externalized because the how of migration control, the main technique of migration control is the instrument called the visa. And when you apply for a visa, you do that usually from your home country. And it's either a private company or a consulate decides on if you're entitled to a visa. We don't know that much actually about how visa processing works, but anybody who routinely has to apply for visas, and that'll be a portion of you in the room, knows that it can be highly arbitrary. And anthropologists who actually sit in the room with Schengen visa officers deciding cases just have revealed fantastic patterns of prejudicial decision making. But the other uh, aspect of migration governance that we might want to bear in mind are carrier sanctions because it's only because of carrier sanctions that people who don't have their papers in order can't board regular ferries and planes when they're on the move. And carrier sanctions are relatively understudied. So when I was searching for a book on them, I found the only one I know, which is a doctoral study done in the Netherlands. So there's a lot more work to do there. But it's this apparatus of visas plus carrier sanctions which has a huge set of implications for people seeking protection, particularly in the global north. It means that would-be protection seekers have vastly divergent experiences. If you don't need a visa and you can cross borders with relative ease, then you'll meet Frontex with the teddy bears out, like they were for the Ukrainian arrivals. And I'm, I'm not minimizing the difficulty or trauma or fleeing the conflict in Ukraine. But, you know, they met a system and then a system of temporary protection, partly because Ukrainians were entitled to visa free travel to enter the EU since 2017. And at the other Polish border, in that instance with Belarus, you still have a militarized border where in this photograph you see would-be refugees being rounded up. So this differentiated border becomes privatized through carrier sanctions. And then we illegalize a lot of the resultant travel. And it's in particular refugees, broadly speaking, people seeking protection, who are at the sharp end of those practices. What it means is people die making dangerous journeys in an era when travel is safe. That's simply a matter of the carrier sanctions policies that we put in place. There is a pushback, there is a global move to try to open up safe travel routes for refugees in particular. Uh, but I don't think we're doing enough in this area. Legally, I think what we've also done is over-criminalize the assistance to border crossers, but there's some interesting moves to push back against that. So when we talk about smugglers, especially in the public discourse, we're invited to imagine these dangerous criminals putting people's lives at risk, which is one form of smuggling. 
But our criminal definitions actually criminalize any kind of assistance to people crossing borders irregularly. And there are currently some successful, some pending court challenges in judicial bodies, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the ECOWAS Court in Africa, uh, successful cases in Canada and France, the individual uh, giving the victory sign is Cédric Carou, a French farmer who won his case in the Conseil d'État um, about um, how pro prohibiting his actions, helping people enter France seeking protection, was a violation of his constitutional rights. So I think th the message that I wanted to convey is that um, when we look at how migration is governed, it's governed very unequally across the world. There is a differentiation, obviously, between migrants and refugees. But even before we get into that discussion, and I'm happy and hoping to discuss that with the students, I think what's really crucial is to bear in mind that your mi migration opportunities, your mobility opportunities in the world, depend in the first instance on the accident of birth of your passport. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, I was wondering, uh, thank you for such mm. a good speech. Um, I was uh, wondering, after the uh, war in Ukraine, um, we saw that there was a difference in how Europe treated the refugees that came from Ukraine, Ukraine uh, compared to uh, other humanitarian crises in the world. Uh, why do you think this is? Is this because of like ra racism or is it because of Europe being a bordering state to actual war zone? I think it's a really good question and it's a question that we should have an answer for because there's such radically different treatment to different groups of protection seekers that I think, you know, it looks uh, like one group is being privileged over another. So I think part of the reason is accident. So in 2017, when the EU decided to grant visa-free access to the European territory to Ukrainians, I d they didn't anticipate the 2022 full-scale invasion of the country. So there's that element. I think the other factor that really makes a difference is that Europe or your EU states are the first countries of asylum. So people are fleeing directly into Poland. So that's a legitimate reason for differentiating. And the scale of arrivals then. I think what was truly unpredictable and unpredicted was that the EU triggered the EU Temporary Protection Directive. So this is a measure that had been on the EU uh, statute books since 2001, and everybody had said that it was totally unrealistic. It, was, it offered uh, protection seekers too many rights. In 2015, there was no serious discussion of triggering it, but there was a sufficient political consensus. And there, I think you have to look at the geopolitics. So the, the global refugee regime, although it's legalized and full of principles, is also full of politics. And it's often the case that states and regions welcome refugees that are fleeing their enemies, or if not their overt enemies, where they want to show solidarity with those fleeing. Um, now, what I would say is that it should really make us pause and think again about how we treat other asylum seekers and refugees, because other asylum seekers and refugees not only have to risk their lives traveling, they're also immobilized once they get into the EU. And the de facto situation for Ukrainians is that they've been able to travel and pick their country of refuge. And I think that's also a much better system. So I think we can learn from what's happening and then hopefully, I haven't seen this in the EU political discourse, but hopefully then try to uh, see how refugee situations can be managed through mobility rather than trying to immobilize and contain refugees. When discussing migration policy, it has become clear that restricted migration policy is a clear trend, not only in Sweden, but in Europe as a whole. So what do you believe are the future prospects of governance and policies connected to migration? And what upcoming trend do you think will shape the future? Uh, so I think the question is a, a really good one. Uh, the premise, I'm not sure about. So have migration policies really gotten more restrictive? I think rhetoric about migration has definitely gotten more uh, restrictive and anti-migration in a lot of countries. 
What we often see in reality is that the policies don't change that much. And so I think the scholars who have studied this more systematically, Heinde Haas is coming to mind, who has a great new book out called How Migration Really Works, would have asserted always that policies aren't really getting more restrictive. But I think what they are doing is getting more differentiated or more selective. So one trend that's clear in the last 20 years is containment practices towards refugees. So, you know, refugees dr drowning in the Mediterranean wasn't happening in mass 20 years ago because we didn't have carrier sanctions. Um, but even in the countries that talk tough about migration, they often have very high levels of labor migration or they still have family migration pathways that, you know, where they are still admitting quite a lot of people. Because often migration is driven by demand, employer demand, and even conservative or right-wing governments want to meet employer demand in some way. But the rhetoric is tougher, so, and that shapes how people treat each other. So it has other consequences, even if it's not being followed through in real, real policies. Mm, uh, thank you for the, mm. the lecture and uh, I wanted to ask, when we talk about uh, migration, it tends to be a very broad concept that encompasses a lot of definitions, but uh, when you see where does the migration happen is in urban agglomerations, like in cities, in, that's where it happens, that's when you see the interactions of society. So in that regard, do you, you were mentioning discrimination. Do you think like, is there a direct re relationship in cities or lo localities and discrimination as like, is this planning of the city of the places where we live in voluntarily contribute to these discrimination uh, topics you were mentioning? That's such a good question question that I'm not at all qualified to answer, but that won't stop me. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so when lawyers talk about discrimination, they're talking about certain forms of wrongdoing, by, usually by employers or by the state, you know, and how they make certain goods or opportunities available. And so, but we know there's a spatial dimension to that, so that residential segregation, for example, can mean that people have more problems accessing certain types of services. So actually understanding that better is a really important task, I think, for urban planners like you and for legal scholars like me, maybe working together a bit better to think about the spatial dimensions. Um, I mean, the ideal of the city is exactly this kind of idea, where we're all intermingled from all over the world. I mean, that's such a... That's the ancient idea of the metropolis, you know, that it's where people come together, a right to the city. But, you know, as somebody who grew up in a small town in the countryside, you know, that's also a place of diversity, but maybe in different ways. But, but I think these spatial questions and how they interact with discrimination are really important ones. Oh, okay, I can say mm -hmm. another question then. Uh, like, considering the uh, hostile discussion against the uh, like refugees and also different kind of migrants, like what can we do that's actually a, a policy to strengthen the rights of refugees that's trying to come to, for example, Europe today? That, that can also gain some political uh, uh, will, uh, goodwill. Yeah. So after 2015, I... My hope was that it would be the sort of crisis that led everybody to say never again and change their thinking. And the never again part that I sort of naively imagined or hoped for was that we wouldn't keep refugees in this situation where they had to travel illegally to seek protection. Because that seems to me one of those policies that's inhumane and also lose-lose. So it means that for asylum seekers who come to Europe, if they've had to come irregularly, they have to, uh, you know, sell their belongings, risk their lives, split apart families, split apart communities, often end up indebted, and debt is the single biggest risk, exploitation risk, when people are on the move. So it seems to be really bad for protection seekers, but also host communities, because people arrive uh, completely depleted, and then they claim asylum, and then asylum procedures take too long. So I really felt, you know, we would really rethink the foundations. And sadly, I think the lesson, certainly in some European countries, was yes, that was a crisis, 
never again, but the never again was we're going to keep containing refugees elsewhere, even though we know these containment practices can backfire. So I still think this question about access and understanding how visas plus carrier sanctions force people into dangerous routes is the, is the nub of the problem. Because once people come to Europe to claim asylum, you know, if the procedures work, that's a big if and they don't always, you know, there are rights for refugees in Europe that are real. Uh, it's just that they're very difficult to access. And I think, you know, still making that one of the central political messages, I think is really, really worthwhile. We don't have that much time left, mm. but since I'm representing the International Youth Think Tank and I also met many students here today, I would like to direct my question to the students in the room and everyone watching. What is your advice for students that are passionate about this field and that want to work within this field? Because often when we speak about migration, it's pretty highly influenced by legislation. And maybe not, not all students here are maybe focusing on law. And what would your advices be for us? <laughs> oh. um, I don't think career advice can ever be in the abstract because I think, I mean, from our previous panel about, uh, with Nobel Prize winners talking about their life driven by curiosity, you know, I think if you find something that you're passionate about to study and that can become your job, uh, that's, you know, that's a golden opportunity. But for years I taught in an interdisciplinary center where students studied refugee studies that had happened through lenses of political science, anthropology, law, and, um, and sociology. And it was always interesting, this uh, faith people had that if they studied law, they would have a stronger advocacy tool for migrants and refugees. Um, and I, I think that can be true. Legal mobilization can be really powerful, but in some ways legal mobilization is, uh, you know, is, is only necessary if politics isn't working. So I would say, you know, if you want to do the right thing for refugees and migrants, that's really the obligation that everybody has as a citizen. And so, so I would say just, you know, think about it in those ways. Um, you know, I'm also loath to tell anybody to become a lawyer, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, good lawyers are, can do good work, so. Thank good question. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Great. We have one minute for a really quick one, or should we? Uh... <laughs> so in terms of yeah. um, l policies or mm. regulations, do you think there is an immediate challenge that has to be addressed with major priority in order to r achieve a better regulated migration processes? In uh, no, not a single problem. I think there are lots of small problems. I think we could do with a fundamental rethink, but if we're not going to have a fundamental rethink, I think we should reflect about the maldistribution of mobility opportunities in the world and really start to think about how you would accord people mobility opportunities more equally. Right. Thank you for Thank the great so questions. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was lovely.